So this is Alex Danis, um, and this is part of what I think I might call sofa science. Ooh. It's like shed science, oh. but it's more chilled. We're on a sofa. Oh, sofa. And it's going to be a series where I just chat to other science YouTubers about the questions that you're always asking me and that I think are really interesting and that I always ask other science YouTubers when I finally meet them. So I thought I might as well record it so that you don't have to get asked the same questions again. Sounds good. Um, so to start off, because we only actually met today. Yes. This is the weird thing. Which it? is so crazy. Because I think we've known each other online for like five years. Yeah, for a very long time. And yet we've only met in person today. But it was weird because you showed up and I was like, oh, hey, I know yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Wait, I've never actually and met exactly. you. Exactly. Just like, and like, I know what you've been doing with your grad school yeah. and stuff. And you know what I've been yeah. doing. So yeah, tell us about what it is that you do. Tell me, t introduce them to your channel. Yes. So my channel uh, is currently just my name uh, because it is following my life in graduate school or trying to at least. So I'm vlogging from the lab and talking about what I'm doing, talking about cool science that I like. And yeah, because I'm currently a third year graduate student in a genetics program and that is weird and odd sometimes. So I am video documenting it. A lot of what I do in lab on a day-to-day -day basis consists of moving clear liquids from one tube to another tube. Those liquids can be anything from DNA to enzymes to DNTPs to buffers to who knows what, but they all look almost exactly the same. I'm also often trying to do multiple things at once. Maybe I'm starting this experiment while another experiment incubates, and then this one is happening over here, and I have to remember that later I have to put my digests in, and there's often a lot of stuff happening. And both of those things together, I think, leads to mistakes. Stupid mistakes. How did you get started on YouTube? Boring question, but... Oh, so... Honestly, I got started on YouTube in about 2007 and all of those videos are gone and it was the early days of YouTube and I was posting stupid videos of me in college and my friends and then ended up taking all of those down but one of the very first ones that I had put up was me lip syncing to a song by Aaron Carter. Yes! And the first one went up when I was 17 and then I took it down and then I redid it again when I was 20. Uh, and I put the two videos side by side and I posted it on Vimeo actually and sent it around to a couple of my friends and I thought it was funny. So then at 23, another three years later, I did another one and I put them all side by side in a video and posted it online and then 300,000 people watched it. And I thought, well, if there are 300,000 people here, I might as well teach them some science. And so I decided to combine my love of science and my love of video and I started posting science YouTube videos. So you never kind of set out to think, I'm going to make science videos, just a kind of, I've got this audience, what can I do with it? Well, it had sort of been an idea that I had toyed with, that I had both a bio degree and a film degree, and I was working in a media job, and so I didn't sort of have that science outlet anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I'd been thinking about like, oh, maybe I could make science videos, like this would be kind of fun, it would sort of, you know, fulfill both of those parts of me, but there hadn't really been something that had pushed me over the edge of actually doing it until that. And that was what I was like, oh. Oh, people are watching? Okay, great. Science. We're going to talk about science now. So you'd done your undergraduate degree yes. in science? Yes. And, and film. And film. Yes, I have a dual degree in science, in biology and film, television, and interactive media studies. What does that cover? Uh... It covers a lot less than it sounds like it covers. It was a, a sort of a history of film major with some production courses tossed in. Okay. And then you left science? I did leave science and the way I got there was a pretty odd route. So the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago when I was 21 okay. held a competition to try and find somebody to live in the museum for a month. And so I thought this was crazy and I thought it was also something I wanted to do. Wait, when you say live? Yeah. So they were looking for someone to live in the museum nonstop for 30 days and sort of act as a science communicator. So I applied and I made it through the interviews to the top five. And so I got to go out to Chicago and there was a big ceremony and I didn't get it. So another... You did get it. Uh, Kate McGrorty, um, who did a fantastic, amazing job. She was absolutely wonderful. But even though I didn't get it, that sort of put my name out there as someone who's interested. So actually somebody in the alumni group of my college um, saw my name and was like, oh, I know somebody who does something like that, who does something like that. And I sort of fell along this path of people until I hit the most amazing job I could have gotten out of college, which was working at an interactive media company that specialized in uh, videos and sort of touchscreens 
and interactives for museums. And so I got to work for two years for them doing all sorts of amazing installations uh, for museums across the country. And that really taught me everything I know about film from how to, you know, be on set to how to edit videos. It was sort of the hands-on film experience that I got from being hands-on in a lab in science sort of transferred outside of it. Mm -hmm. So it was honestly the best job I have ever had. And they were such a supportive, awesome group of people. And I learned so much from them. And that was from not winning this museum competition. Yeah. Which has sort of been like a lesson to me in my life that even if there's something that I know it sounds crazy and even if I don't get it like I try and go for those things just because you never you never know what's going to come out of it and what Mm -hmm. came out of it was the most amazing job I could have had and I was so grateful for it so yeah I sort of took a detour out of science for a couple years and were you in front of the camera at all for that job I was not, no. I was completely behind the camera. I was an associate producer, and they crazily trusted me to do all kinds of parts of that job, from, you know, going on set to talking with clients to trying to come up with exhibit ideas. Like, they had way more faith in me than they should have. Um, But it gave me exposure to a lot of different things. But I was completely behind the scenes, Mm -hmm. behind the camera in that job. So I think YouTube during that time also gave me an outlet for being in front of the camera and talking to people and doing that part of it that I also really, Mm -hmm. really love. And how did you find being on camera for the first time? Because I know that's something that puts up a lot of people is, oh, I don't want to be seen. And for some people as well, it's a kind of, I don't want my scientific expertise being judged Mm. by your peers. So how did you kind of feel about other people around you in real life, um, for want of a better word? Um, thinking of it's like seeing your YouTube videos. Yeah. Ooh, hello. Well, it's funny because at the time I was so far outside of science that I wasn't worried about my scientific expertise being judged. Um, and so it was certainly kind of odd the first time my coworkers found my videos, but they were again, so supportive that it was fine. Mm-hmm. But this time around, you know, I'm in graduate school. I am in thankfully a very supportive lab and a department who so far seems very supportive of what I'm doing. Um, But I do always keep in mind that even though I totally speak only for myself and not at all for the department, for my lab, any of that, it is totally all 100% me, I do keep in mind that like I am going to be a reflection of my department and my institution. Mm -hmm. And so it has added perhaps even a stricter level of trying to make sure that everything that I say is 100% like everything I said before, I wanted to make 100% scientifically sound, but here I feel like there's more than just my reputation lying on it. So I do have that thought in mind now that, okay, this isn't just me. This is a bit more. Yeah. Cause you kind of had a, a comeback really. Cause 'cause you started off making these bite-sized videos, which were kind of like your standard YouTube fan now Yeah. where you pick a topic and you think it through, but now you're doing very much a kind of, it's more of a vlogging style almost of being a grad student. Yes. Vlogging is hard. I thought coming from bite-sized videos, which I mean, I spent so much time researching and editing and one of those videos could take like 20 to 30 hours if it took a lot of background or or a lot of animation that going to this, I was like, oh, this will be nothing. I'll just sit in front of the camera and I'll talk. Vlogging is really hard. And it's also, you know, I work in a lab with a lot of other people. And so I don't feel comfortable taking the camera around with me in the lab during the day because I don't want to intrude on their lives Mm -hmm. as well. So it's been sort of an interesting thing to try and find the balance of sitting in front of the camera and talking, but also not dragging the camera around with me, but also keeping it interesting and also just trying to be sort of genuine and relevant to Mm -hmm. the life and experience I'm having now in graduate school. So it has been a lot harder in a good way. Like it's been sort of fun to figure out what I want to do, but yeah, I had a comeback in a completely unscripted different way. And I'm still sort of trying to figure out what it is and where it's going. And Why did what's you kind of peter off with the first videos and what made you decide to come back? Uh, I went to grad school thinking that I could totally keep up videos. It was no grad school. The, getting settled into the first year or two of graduate school was hard and overwhelming. And I had moved across the country. And so my entire life had been completely upturned again in a good way. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was so overwhelmed and, uh, really trying to focus on getting my footing in graduate school. And so I felt like 
this past December that I could make a comeback because I finally, I had my project going in on its feet. I'd passed my qualification exams. I was finally in sort of a settled enough place out here that I could start adding something else back into my life. And did you miss making the videos when you weren't making them? Yes. 100% yes. I really did miss making videos. I miss talking about science. I missed most editing videos. I love video editing. And so if I wanted to edit something, I needed to, I needed to film something to edit. I don't understand that. Oh. Video editing is the thing that I hate least. Oh, and so probably favorite. this will be an almost an unedited. Maybe I should make this an unedited edited video series and then I don't have to do any editing yeah then it's really easy no I I love editing what do you love about editing I feel like for me it's one of the most creative parts of it and it's I don't know I just get super in the zone I like put on my headphones and I'm at my computer and it's nine o'clock at night and then suddenly it's one o'clock in the morning and I've been editing all night and I just lose time I just love the process of putting them together and trying to put the sound with it and figuring out where things go and I will say that uh, the videos I've been doing now are far less complicated than the bite-sized videos so I am trying to think about ways of adding in more complication just because I'm I'm not having as much fun with them because it's sort of like okay just edit me together Mm -hmm. um so that is one thing that I'm trying to think about putting back in is like throwing in some b-roll yeah putting in some b-roll i've been filming a ton of b-roll this week i've been b-roll for those that don't know Mm. is um so for example now we will have a cutaway of the cat and that means that you can hide the edit and so yeah this thing where we're still talking but you can't see us because something else is showing that's b-roll yes so yeah so i've been trying to do more of that i've been trying to think about ways i can add in simple animations um yeah just stuff to make it more creative and more fun i i just love that piece of it what do you use to do editing uh, so I use the Adobe Suite. So I do uh, Premiere for my video editing, After Effects for animation, and then Illustrator to make all of the different pieces of the animation. And there's because I use that as well, but I, I hate After Effects. I, I just don't like oh. editing. But how did you find learning it? So I'm guessing you taught, or were you taught that on your course? No. So we did all Apple products in college, and then. We did a combination of Apple and After Effects when I went to the media company, but that was mostly self-taught, and it was a huge uphill battle. Um, Sorry, the cat wants to play. Um. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, learning all of the Adobe products was an uphill battle, but once you get to, like, even a little bit up that hill, you start to realize all the possibilities, and then it sort of becomes a fun, creative thing to try and figure out everything that's there. Uh, but it is a steep learning curve. That's, mm-hmm. that's the phrase I'm looking for. It's yeah. a steep learning curve. Yeah, no, it definitely is. And do you feel like you're now proficient at it? or? Oh, no, absolutely not. Okay. I feel like, especially with a lot of the Adobe products, there are 12 different ways to do each thing you want to do. And I've probably only explored two for each thing. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like there is massive untapped potential in all of those projects that I'm hope- I will hopefully get to one day, but I'm not there yet. So that's the editing side of things. Yes. Um, what about the... Sorry, it's really difficult to interview whilst also there's a cat being very distracting. We should interview Mr. Darcy. <laughs> we should. Um, so that's the editing. What about the writing and the coming up with ideas? Because before you would very much think of an idea yes. and research and script it, whereas now it's much more of a kind of... you inherently have that knowledge because it's about your experiences exactly so it it is a lot more spontaneous now and that again that has its pros and its cons so in some ways it makes me way more free to talk about all kinds of things Uh, you know i did one video um, on some mental health issues in the sciences i've done videos talking about exams i have to go through and then i've also done videos talking about strict science things or equipment in the lab so it frees me up a lot but it does sometimes mean that with that lack of research the other day I was filming a whole bunch of b-roll for a different video and I was like okay I'll do a quick pickup video right now and I turned on the camera I turned on the microphone I sat down in front of it and I stared at the camera and I didn't know what to say and I turned off the camera because I hadn't I had no idea I had no script and so there is still some level of sort of background thought and research and scripting that has to go into it but it is sort of research of my own brain which is yeah because you would edit a script and so if you're not writing a script you don't have that structured period of time in which you kind of structure your thoughts right so I do now at the beginning when I started doing this I thought it would be completely unscripted all the time but now I do definitely go into a lot of them with either a a bullet point list of things I want to talk about or for some of the more lab related ones a script um, but it's a far more conversational one and mm-hmm. so I feel better about that and, and a lot of them are just bullet points of like I want to talk about that thing that thing and that thing 
And now you're going from being just a person who explains the science to talking about your life. How yeah. did you find like judging how much of your personal life to keep personal? How much? Because you you're quite vocal about the things that you get wrong in your science as well, yes. which is great to watch. Yeah, um, I feel like not enough people do that. People mm-hmm. only talk about the good things in science and the times that things go right. And I think that so much of science is things not going right and you persisting through experiments failing over and over and over and over again. Um, and people don't talk about that. And so I want to make a point of talking about that stuff too. And did you consciously think beforehand, these are the things that I will share, these are the things that I will keep private? Yeah, I think... I have to this point, I certainly don't bring a camera around with me and vlog sort of daily vlogs like people like Casey Neistat mm-hmm. do where you're like in every aspect of his life. Mm-hmm. It's definitely just my lab life and that's where I feel comfortable at the moment. That doesn't mean that I won't ever sort of branch out into the rest of my life or take my camera out, you know, into the city and stuff. But at the moment, that's sort of definitely where I feel comfortable is just sharing my lab life because I also feel like that's the reason why people are there at my channel because they're interested in science in some way you know they're probably not interested in what shoes I'm wearing that morning like that's that's what people are there for and talking about your audience who watches your channel so based on my YouTube demographics don't you love the analytics oh yes uh my audience is 80 percent male 20 percent female uh and generally in the 20 to 40 year old Category. Okay, that's quite similar to mine. How do yeah. you feel about that? Because obviously you're not a 20 to 40 year old male. I'm not a 20 to 40 year old male, but I certainly I am happy for everybody who watches. And I do have a very supportive community of people who watch me. My comment section is one of, I think, the most civil and like nice and supportive and like... I'll raise you my comment section. I reckon mine's nice. That's, well. that's... Yours might be nicer. Mine have lots of scientific insights. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I honestly have heard a lot of... Like there will be people in my videos making comments on the science that I didn't know. And so I'm learning from them too. So I think that all of that is great. So I do love my subscriber base. Um, though I certainly, you know, as a woman in science would hope to attract a few more women. So I don't want to lose any of my male subscribers. Mm -hmm. They are all wonderful, but I want to grow that 20% of female subscribers, but I, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. I have no idea either. No. Why do you have any ideas as to why maybe there are more men watching? I, so from the YouTubers I have talked to most of the males, have more female subscribers and most of the women have more male subscribers. Mm -hmm. That is a a trend that I have zero statistics to back up, but one that I have noticed. And I guess that does make some sense. I actually laughed. One of my videos showed up in a subreddit recently, and I'm not going to remember the acronym correctly. It was a very long acronym that was something like, you know, uh, upvote not because cute girl, but because cool thing, but will concede did originally click because cute girl. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, well, at least you're conceding that. So mm-hmm. I feel like there might be some aspect of that in my viewership. Yeah. How much do you kind of think about you on camera, like your appearance on camera, the way that you talk, the way that you dress, like all the kind of things that goes into not just being a voice, but being visual as well? Yeah. So before, when I was doing my bite size videos, I thought a lot about that. I would always wear makeup. I'd always have my hair done. I would be wearing something nice. Now, I don't care. Some days I am wearing makeup, some days I am not. And the days that I'm not, I get a lot of comments about like, you look really tired. And I'm like, yes, I have zero concealer under my eyes. Um, So people do comment on your appearance. They do. But again, with the rare exception, none of it, it... The rare exception is gross and weird, but my general commenters and subscribers might make a comment about it, but it's not out of something that a friend might casually mention that, oh, you look tired or, oh, you look nice today. Like those things don't bother me. Okay. Um, So I, I do get those kinds of things, but as long as they're not like over the edge, like, yeah, you notice those things about people Mm -hmm. and that's fine by me. Do you think that your, the way that your YouTube would change if you had a different YouTube audience? So, so do you think that, say, you had an audience that was less nice or more concerned with your appearance or more picky about the science, do you think that you would change what you make and how you make it if your audience was a different one? 
I hope not. I think that all of the content I would be making would be the same because I do like the content I'm making now. I think if there were a strong negative reaction to it, I don't think I would change what I was doing, but I think I might reconsider why I was doing it and who I was doing it for. Because right now I try and do it for me and I'm doing things that I want. But there was one of my caffeine video got a lot of views. Mm -hmm. And so it went outside of my community. And this was a pre-Invisalign Alex and I would say that 70% of the comments I got were about how I looked like a snaggletoothed ferret mm -hmm. or every comment under the sun about my teeth. And it was just disheartening to me because I was like, that's fine. I look in a mirror. I know what my teeth look yeah. like. Did you listen to the science? I had forgotten that that was a thing. Yeah. yeah that was a big thing in that your comment section. That was a section. big thing in my comment section for a while. And I was like, I, I understand that they looked odd. And well, they were just teeth. They were, but they were just teeth. And I was like, I like don't get why you're so hung up on this. And you're not here for my mouth. I hope, like, I hope you're here for the science. Yeah. And so, I did think at that point in time because this was before I had shut off YouTube co comments going to email, and I was 23, I think. And so, you know, an adult and doing my own thing. My age. Yeah. Your age. Yeah. But waking up every morning to an inbox full of comments about how crazy I looked and how I was so awful looking that I shouldn't be on video. I should only make blogs. Like that stung after a while. As thick of a skin as I feel like I have, I was like, oh, well, then why am I doing this if that's all you're going to focus on? Mm -hmm. um, so that is a long way of saying that I hope I am always making content that I like and enjoy and feels genuine to me. But if I ever feel like people don't care about the content and they're mm -hmm. so focused on me, like then I might start to reconsider why and how I'm doing it, I guess. And how do you pick what it is about your grad life that you do a video about? Mm. So grad life is an exceptionally emotional experience. Hell yes. <laughs> and uh, I make videos about whatever I'm emotional about that week. <laughs> And so sometimes that's a happy thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes that is a, I can't believe I made this mistake in lab. I'm real upset about it. I'm going to vlog about it. And so honestly, at the moment, it is completely emotionally driven of like, mm -hmm. here is the thing that is making me feel all the feelings right now. Camera. <laughs> and how long in advance do you think about it? Or is it very much a, I'm feeling emotional. Let's film it straight away whilst I'm in the moment. Yeah. So most of them I do sort of let settle for a couple of days before I film mm -hmm. often just for logistics reasons that it's hard to find a time in the lab where there's nobody else around because people work nights and weekends. And so for there to be a time for me to have a quiet spot in the lab, generally I have to wait a couple of days. Is that because of the sound in the lab interfering with the video quality or you don't want to have your lab mates watching you? I don't want to disturb them while they're working. It is our workplace. And so I don't ever want to disturb somebody's time while they're actually working with me babbling about my feelings on graduate school over in the corner. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just trying to respect their space mm -hmm. and what they're doing. Um, but yeah, there, there was one video that I was exceptionally upset in the moment. And I made a video, it was like 10 o'clock at night, an experiment had failed, I was all alone in the lab. And then I got home and there was something wrong with the video file. And I was so upset because there was this thing. And then the one part of it I could watch, I was like, yeah, I was probably a little too emotional right now. Probably shouldn't okay. post that anyways. But that is the only one so far in this revamp that I've filmed and then been like, mm, maybe you should think about that a couple days, like late night in the lab, Alex. And how has it affected your relationship with your supervisor? Oh, he's super supportive of it. Does he uh, watch them? He does. And I thought at first that he was saying that to be nice. And then he has started like referring to parts of them. So I know that he watches them. Um, so it's, it's great that he's supportive. And like one of the ones I'm filming right now, um, I am using lab supplies in them. So I asked him like, I will reimburse you for this and stuff. And he was like, nope, nope, funded by the Ashley lab. Like, go for it. Do your DNA extractions. Do what you want to yeah. do. So that's that's all been really nice that he's been so great. And also lets me use the lab to film. Yeah. Where do you get your inspiration from? As in, who inspires you that's in maybe the science YouTube community or science TV? Like, who do you, when you want inspiration, who do you go to? That's a good question. I... <laughs> 
Clearly, Sally LePage and Julia Wilde are two of my biggest science on YouTube inspirations. You can't spot Julia is just and Julia. Here. We're filming in Julia's living that room. That was her cat. Um, <laughs> why? That's that's an interesting choice. Oh, there. I know, isn't it though? Yeah. I mean, coincidence. <laughs> so funny. Um, honestly, though, I do think that you make fantastic, wonderful, well put together videos. Um, Julia does as well, but. <laughs> But, right, like, your most recent one, you were in a field with flies and shit. And, like, mm-hmm. you get out there and you mm-hmm. do the things. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is so fantastic. Um, but I, I actually try a lot to get inspiration from outside of the YouTube science community. I love the YouTube science community. Everybody is wonderful. But I think that being able to bring in styles from things like podcasts, um, things like in some ways, you know, fictional TV shows, like trying to bring in things from outside to give it some outside interest uh, and try and science communicate in new ways is something that I definitely try and do. And so I actually saw Jad, I'm going to pronounce his last name wrong, Abumrad, 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 Jad Abumrad talk at Stanford recently. And he gave just... Who who is that? So he is from Radiolab. He's one of the hosts of Radiolab. Um, And he was talking about making podcasts. And I found so much of just the creative process ideas of like, you got to go out there. You got to chase the antelope if you're doing a story about chasing antelopes. Like you got to do it yourself and get out there and get on the field. Um, That... That and some of the other stuff he thought he talked about, I think, was super inspiring to me of like, yeah, I got to get out there and I got to get out in the field with the cows and the shit and the flies. And like, but but that's that's hard for me to do in graduate school at the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I'm trying to incorporate. more. But also for you out there is in the lab. Yeah, out there is in the lab. Um, But what I would love to start expanding into doing, and I've already started convincing some people, is to go out there into other people's labs. Um, So other people at Stanford are clearly the easiest first choice. I've had this idea too. Yeah, Yeah. because I think that like I am showing my graduate school experience, but that is such a sliver of the graduate school experience. It is only mine and there Mm -hmm. are different like everybody has a different one yeah and I find that to be so fascinating Mm -hmm. and so I I've been talking to some people who do very different things in other lives but like can I come and follow you with the camera will you let me do that yeah um and so I have some people who said yes so I'm trying to add that in soon too to like talk to other graduate students Mm -hmm. because I also feel like whenever there's a new scientific discovery people talk to the PI in the lab and you know the person who runs the lab principal investigator yes very important person They're the professor. They're the professor. They're often not the person who actually did the experiments because they're running the lab, they're writing the grants, they're doing all this stuff. And I feel like people think that they are the people doing the experiments. And that's fine. They were at some point in time. But I really want to show people that the grad students and the postdocs and the undergrads and the people on the ground doing the science, what is their life like? Who are they? What are they doing? How are they doing it? Are they in lab at midnight making gels to run something on or do they, you know, waltz in at noon? Like, I I just want to show that broad range of experiences and all the people who are doing science outside of just me because I am just a tiny sliver. So it's teaching the big scientific discoveries through the small human stories. Yes. So I just put a note up over my computer recently that says... That's the cat. That's the cat. Um, That says, tell science through human stories. And this is like what I am trying to move towards is how do I tell science through human stories, the humans behind the science. And talking about moving forwards, where do you see yourself after grad school, after Uh, your PhD? Yeah, so definitely science communication. Not academia? Not academia. Sorry, Alex, it's PI. Oh, he knows. Oh, I'm sure he does. He knows. (laughs) Mine knows as well. I told, so uh, we have a committee of three additional professors that we meet with once a year and talk with. And at my very first committee meeting, I told them up front, you know, like, here's all my science. Here's what I want to do. By the way, I want to go into science communication. And they are such wonderful, sweet people. But one of them looked at me and said, you know who has to do a lot of science communication? Professors. (laughs) And I was like, yes, but that's not what I mean. Um... So, yeah, so I've been very upfront about that the whole time I've been in graduate school, and people have been very supportive of that, which has been good. So definitely science communication. My ideal life would be to own my own small, small production company and be able to travel and talk to the scientists I want to talk to about the science I want to talk about and really get to those humans behind the science and do some sort of science documentary type thing, be that on YouTube or be that long-form content. 
talking to the people doing the science and really getting them out there and getting the science out there with them. And so would you be producing that, directing that, hosting that? My ideal would be that I would be not filming it, that I would have a camera person, but that I would be hosting, producing, and oh, editing. Here comes trouble. <laughs> so I want to be the host, producer, editor. Okay. Um, and then somebody else can film it, and then I probably need an intern or assistant to help with all three of those things, mm-hmm. and then maybe also someone with some business knowledge to help me pay the bills on time. Um, penultimate question. Yeah. What video are you proudest of? I would say my dominant versus recessive alleles video, where I did a scientific noir, is my favorite video that I have ever made. Um, I remember that one now. I had so much fun making that video, and I think, I hope, it really clearly communicated the message um, as best as possible. Though I will say... The video that I get the most thank yous on for people thanking me because they didn't understand the concept before is saturated versus unsaturated fats. I get comments weekly, so people are still watching this video thanking me because they didn't get it before and then they watched my video and they got it. And at the time, I didn't think that was going to be any sort of big thing, but that is one of my most popular videos and the one that I get the most thank yous on. And so I'm super proud that I did something that people are like, thank you, I get it now. So I like that one too, actually. That's cool. Yeah. And last question, Mm -hmm. what do you want people to know about you and Science YouTube and your videos that you don't think that they know? Mm. That's hard because I try and be pretty honest in them. I think that there's still only a small slice of grad school that... Sometimes I worry that people think I'm trapped in the lab all the time because I don't take the camera outside of it. And so I think that, I guess it's important for me that people know that I also have like a happy, fulfilling life outside of the lab, even though I don't show it to you. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I do, I've gotten a lot of comments recently that people are like, I see a burnout coming, like you're going to burn out, you're going to do this. And like, yeah, I overwork myself a lot and I know that, but I do try and balance that with outside stuff. So I guess maybe that I am a whole human being. Um, I can confirm that she does have three dimensions. I do have three dimensions and I really like baking and I really like watching Netflix and yeah, I, I'm a person. That's the lamest answer. I, I know. I, I think, I think that's fair. Okay. I think that's really good. Um, all of your social media, where can, where can people find you? Yes. So it's all just my name now, which is great. Mm-hmm. So I am at Alex Danis, D-A-I-N-I-S on Twitter and on Instagram and YouTube. The channel name is now Alex Danis. Uh, Facebook is still bite-sized, B-I-T-E-S-C-I-Z-E-D, but I don't really use that. People aren't really there. It's not really an active hop in place. So your favorite social network is? Twitter. Okay. Well, the links will be below, obviously. Um, Thanks so much for chatting. Thank you for chatting and for making me hot chocolate. The inaugural Sofa Science. I'm the inaugural one? You are the inaugural one. Oh, I feel so special. I think, yeah, I think Sofa Science is going to be the name. Oh, I I really like Sofa Science. Good. I think this is good. We're going to do Sofa Science then. this is great. Perfect. And, yeah, go follow Alex and her videos and we'll see you next time on Sofa Science. Lots of, like... I'm here for you. Like, you're so important to me. Like, that's, I'm looking at Sony right there, right? Like, I haven't bridged that gap between uh, reaching into the hearts of my audience and Mm -hmm. making that connection and, like, here I am. Um, That's not like a thing. Because you're very much teaching the science. No one sees your personal life. Exactly. Exactly.